grow, and when they start, it will be rather rapid. Are you predicting a timing on this? Because people think back to irrational exuberance and they get very worried when they start thinking of those things. But when you first talked about irrational exuberance with the stock market's valuations, it took a while before the market actually caught up to that and followed suit. Uh, I have no time frame on the forecast. I mean, I have a chart which goes back to 1800. And I can tell you that this particular period sticks out but you have no way of knowing in advance when it actually will trigger because remember uh, in a bull market which is about to break two weeks before the price levels are below the ultimate peak meaning there are more bids than offers so it looks stronger just before it isn't stronger and so that anybody who thinks they're going to make forecasts which work all the time uh, are in for a disastrous <laughs> heading, if I might put it that way. Yeah, I, I, a fair point. It, it, they never ring a bell at the top. You never know these things in advance. But if you're somebody who's kind of reading the warning signs, are, are there red flags along the way, thing, things you might be watching for? Well, what we do is we take the price earnings ratio and invert it to look at an earnings price ratio. And you have to carry this re relationship back. What you find is that uh, the price earnings ratios are largely elevated at the moment as a consequence of real long term interest rates being abnormally low. So we have, for example, you can define the equity, or I should say the earnings price ratio, as the sum of equity premium real interest rates, inflation expectations, and a few other minor issues. But it's an additive phenomenon, and you can see that the major change between, say, 10, 15 years ago and today is that long-term real interest rates are down. Mm -hmm. And that all it has to do is to move up somewhat, and you get stock prices beginning to run into trouble. Okay, so that, that brings us the tie to the stock market. Right now, do you think stock market valuations are, are, are fair or overvalued, or how, how would you judge them? Or is it simply well, you can't judge them without looking at, at, at uh, Treasury prices? Well, look, equity premiums, which is the major component in the price earnings ratio, are about n normal. I mean, they're not particularly out of line. Uh, granted, equity premiums have gone down significantly, but they were abnormally high for a time. That's not where the problem is. The problem shows up very vividly uh, that real, the, the real long-term interest rate component of earnings price ratios is out of line. And when that goes back into line, uh, markets are changing. Uh, if I, I, I don't know when that's going to happen but it's inevitable at some point. Mr. Chairman, this is Joe Terranova. You describe an environment where investment managers are clearly searching for yield. Um, in that search for yield, we've created strategies over the last couple of years which are clearly using passive indexing and significant amount of ETFs in portfolios. Does that concern you at all where we are in the cycle and describing the environment as you have this morning? No, because uh, I've been around an awfully long time. Uh, you have various different ways of forecasting prices. There's only, one st there's only one strategy that I know of which works all the time, and that is that stock prices will always rise more than any other prices because the fear factor in prices is a human nature response. And people who want to sit through uh, markets, in other words, buy and just hold, are those who come out with the best records. The trouble is that once the market starts down, people physically are dis discomforted and have to sleep, uh, sell back down to the sleeping point, as they used to call it. Right. And if you can get around that, you'll do very well. So uh, 
aside from that strategy, I've heard one strategy after another, which is supposed to forecast the markets, and they inevitably fail. Mr. Unless, Mr. They are, unless they are tied to human nature, I don't know what you get out of them. Mr. Chairman, uh, many investors uh, that I know that even look at the market today and say, perhaps just on the fundamentals themselves, things perhaps could be too high. But as long as uh, interest rates are where they are, you, you have to ride the tiger, is what they'll say. Um, what would you be doing with interest rates right now? I mean, what would I be doing with them? Or what as a result of them? You asking, my, you're asking for my personal portfolio. Both. You... I, I, I'd ask both. I'd, I'd ask if you were, if you, if you were at the Fed, what you, what you would be doing, and and, and as a, uh, as a citizen, uh, a shareholder, what you'd be doing. Andrew, I, uh, I was, in, as you know, uh, at the Fed for 18 and a half years. Uh, Paul Volcker never once commented on Federal Reserve policy. And I will tell you, I thought that was very, very, I very much appreciated that. Uh, my version of the Volcker rule is you don't give advice to the people <laughs> who come after you. Um, I don't know if you're going to tell us if you're invested in bank stocks, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I do want to ask you about this notion of the bond bubble. Some uh, out there will, will take a look back at the markets and point to uh, you know, what you say is a bond bubble, the last bubble that we saw, and, and say that these were created effectively by the Fed injecting massive amounts of liquidity into the system. At this point, would you say the Fed has the power to ease this bond bubble off the ledge, or do you think it's more likely that the Fed will do something that will cause this bond bubble to pop? Uh, th those are the types of questions I don't answer because they are, in effect, commenting on current Fed policy. And uh, uh, ask somebody else. Right. <laughs> Alan, <laughs> I, I, me. I have a very different question then. One of the things that there has been a lot of speculation about is uh, who should be uh, the next Fed chair. I won't ask you to speculate about uh, names, but I will ask you this. In terms of temperament, in terms of disposition, in terms of uh, the job itself, a lot of people look, obviously, at, at Janet Yellen. You've heard names uh, like Gary Cohn out there. And uh, there was a quote just this week from the president saying the president wasn't sure that someone like Gary Cohn would actually want a, want a job like this because he's a bit more of a deal maker, perhaps, uh, than somebody who, who, who wants to necessarily look in a very patient way at interest rates. What do you think uh, of the role itself? Uh, Fed chairman is fundamentally an economic forecaster. Uh, all policy depends on what your forecast is. Therefore, the success of your policy really is judged on what your economic capabilities are. And so, as far as I'm concerned, having a forecasting CEO of the Fed is the most important characteristic of the job. And I might add the ability to grit your teeth as markets go against you and the pressures, especially from the Congress, become overwhelming. Uh, if you have those two functions well in hand, uh, anybody who fits that pattern to me is fine. If you don't get that pattern, you're going to run into some troubles because uh, you have to have a technical forecasting ability, and you can't always rely on the terrific Federal Reserve model of the economy, so-called FURBUS, which is the best of those types of models. But models don't always work, and you have to have your own judgment or you'll be at sea. Chairman Greenspan, I, I just want to go back to this point and make sure I'm not misunderstanding things. People like you, people like Warren Buffett, don't make calls on the market very often, times that they think things are either too high or too low. And I just want to put a finer point on this. The idea that you are saying now that you think the bond market is in a bubble that could burst, not claiming it's going to happen today, but you see only one direction for where this is headed, that to me sounds like an irrational exuberance type of statement. Am I fair in, in, in assessing it as such? Becky, perfectly fair. Uh, do I go back and, I, uh, and say, uh, you know, what I was trying to say in that 
AEI speech in 1986, I believe. Uh, the uh, 86, whatever it was. <laughs> in any event, <laughs> in any event uh, what, uh, what I was trying to say is you never be quite sure when irrational exuberance arises. Uh, I was doing it as part of a much broader speech and talking about the analysis of uh, markets and the like. And I wasn't trying to focus short term, but the press loved that term. Uh, I, I'm sort of now questioning whether it was wise to put it in the speech, because that's the process which happens. And I think the question is, uh, I said, how will we know when the markets do that? I wasn't saying that it was going to happen right at that point, but uh, the Tokyo market collapsed when I said it. It's not a, it's a disturbing process because you have to be terribly careful with your words. Uh, so uh, would I have been surprised if the market had cracked at that point? No, I was. So it looks stronger just before isn't stronger. And so that anybody who thinks they're going to make forecasts which work all the time uh, are, are in for a disastrous <laughs> heading, if I might put it that way. Yeah, I, I, a fair point. It, it, they never ring a bell at the top. You never know these things in advance. But if you're somebody who's kind of reading the warning signs, are, are there red flags along the way, thing, things you might be watching for? Well, what we do is we take the price earnings ratio and invert it to look at an earnings price ratio and carry this relationship back. What you find is that uh, the price earnings ratios, oh, and when they start, it will be rather rapid. Are you predicting a timing on this? Because people think back to irrational exuberance and they get very worried when they start thinking of these things. But when you first talked about irrational exuberance with the stock market's valuations, it took a while before the market actually caught up to that and followed suit. Uh, I have no time frame on the forecast. I mean, I have a chart which goes back to 1800. And I can tell you that this particular period sticks out. But you have no way of knowing in advance when it actually will trigger. Because remember, uh, in a bull market which is about to break, two weeks before, the price levels are below the ultimate peak, meaning there were more bids than offer into trouble. OK, so that, that brings us the tie to the stock market. Right now, do you think stock market valuations are, are, are fair or overvalued? Or how, how would you judge them? Or is it simply well, you can't judge them without looking at, at, at uh, Treasury prices? Well, look, equity premiums, which is the major component in the price earnings ratio, are about n normal. I mean, they're not particularly out of line. Uh, granted, equity premiums have gone down significantly. But they were abnormally high for a lot of time. That's not where the problem is. The problem shows up very vividly. Uh, that real, the, the real long-term interest rate component of earnings price ratios is out of line. And when that goes back into line, uh, the markets are changing. Uh, if I, I, I don't know when that's going to happen but it's inevitable at some point. Mr. Chairman, this is Joe Terranova. You describe an environment where investment managers are clearly searching for yield. Um, in that search for yield, we've created strategies over the last couple of years which are clearly using passive indexing and significant amount of ETFs in portfolios. Does that concern you at all where we are in the cycle and describing the environment as you have this morning? No, because uh, I've been around Gerby an awfully long time. Uh, you have various different ways of forecasting prices. There's only one are largely elevated at the moment as a consequence of real long-term interest rates being abnormally low. But we have, for example, you can define the equity, or I should say the earnings price ratio as the sum
of equity premium, real interest rates, inflation expectations, and a few other minor issues. But it's an additive phenomenon, and you can see that the major change between, say, 10, 15 years ago and today is that long-term real interest rates are down. Mm -hmm. And that all that has to do is to move up somewhat and you get stock prices beginning to rise.